Good morning, friends. Uh, Mr. Khan was uh, very happy that there are as many people in the audience as there are on the panel. But we really hope that uh, people will wander in with their coffee or after their coffee. This is a session entitled Internet for All, Exploring a Rights-Based Approach. Um, just a while ago, we were having a conversation with the panelists, and Radhika was saying, you know, around many sessions at the IGF, this question about why do people need to have the internet, you know, was being asked. It was being articulated and re-articulated in, in many ways, especially in the context of debates on rights. So this panel will try to address the question, when we say internet for all, what does it mean as a policy principle? And when we talk about basic principles, such as openness, neutrality, et cetera, do these come as self-sufficing technical logic, or do these come in terms of uh, uh, a socio-political discourse, or even, uh, if you will, a philosophical discourse? So what is the basis of uh, an internet for all? Um, we, I think this is the third IGF, and by now everyone knows that when you talk about the egalitarian propensities of the internet, one is not really talking about something inherent with the internet. We do know that powerful forces mediate the internet, and therefore, what can be a bridge between uh, the internet as a, a techno-social um, phenomenon and um, uh, people's access to the internet. So what can be a bridge between um, the internet and development? So these are the kind of questions that uh, this panel will address. Some of the other questions would be also, uh, what is the internet like from an entitlements framework? So if you talk about an internet for all, then can it be an entitlement? And then what would be the principles that shape it? Uh, we should also probably be able to address um, the categories of consumer and citizen and be able to unpack that uh, during the course of the discussions. What we agreed uh, would be a good way to work this panel is uh, to have five minute inputs, presentations from each of the panelists, then we can take questions and then come back uh, to the panelists again. Um, I invite our first speaker, Mr. Ravi Shankar, from the Ministry of Communications and Information Technology, Government of India. Um, Mr. Ravi Shankar will try and uh, connect the theme to uh, the concept of universalization of the internet. Thank you. Anita, and a very good morning to all the panelists and the audience present here. Uh, when we say internet for all, uh, we try to take the whole discussion away from the internet for a moment to buttress the argument. I'd like to take that uh, drinking water is a facility that all human beings require. And that becomes one of the basic minimum needs for human existence. Governments across the world try and put the public policies in a manner to envelope or cover all citizens in their respective geographical jurisdiction through the provision of these basic minimum services. Similar is the case with public utilities like electricity or road network connectivity. In the Indian context, what we normally say as Bijli Sadak Pani refers to primarily water supply, electricity, and road connectivity as the crucial components for interconnecting people. These are public social goods. We then look at aspects like education and health as imperatives in order to bring about a democratization. Education for all and health for all are themes globally well understood. We have the Education for All movement, which tries to universalize elementary education and subsequently, on the strength of elementary education, move on to higher forms of education or vocationalization. Health for All tries to see that the infancy stage you are able to take care of 
child mortality and then once a child is healthy then the growth parameters are watched and then other diseases are tackled. These are the public policy motives issues that are very much in our psyche. Internet is a new technology, it's a medium. But as a medium it's also perceived as a very important technological innovation which can transform lives in the manner in which the wheel gave mobility to the human entity or the telephone connected people. The internet can bring about convergence. It can connect faster. It can bring about socio-economic change faster. I think that is the underlying element of the internet which makes the internet for all into a discussion of a rights-based approach. When we say universalization, we wish to cover the last man standing. It's the last mile approach. We would not like any individual to be left behind. And that's the driving philosophy of the internet for all. Reaching the next billion is a laudable objective. But reaching the last billion is the most important element in this whole for all. I would like to dwell on that particular component that Internet for All basically tries to drive home the, the point that like provision of drinking water for all is enshrined in the government public policy documents. Similarly, Internet for All should be a public policy drive. The Indian context of Internet for All has got an approach which is local to its context. We have what is known as the National E-Government Plan and through it the Common Service Center Window Approach or Info Kiosk with which everyone is ubiquitously understands it. The Common Service Center is a common platform where people can come about. It's just like a, a public call office in the telephone parlance. And you can come up and walk up to that place and then use it so that it uh, public access available. It's a public access available at a very affordable cost. You just pay the price for the utilization. You drive government to citizen services on it, and whosoever is the entrepreneur using that, uh, uh, running that particular info kiosk can give value-added services. Once you establish these public access points, you make the availability and the affordability as a key element. It's a right. I fully appreciate that. For a citizen, the government should deliver. Government ought to deliver all public goods. So before we talk about a rights-based approach, I would like to define that internet becomes a public good. It should become a public good definable in the sense of education, in the sense of health, in the sense of uh, electricity, in the sense of road connectivity, transportation systems, etc. Once it becomes a public good, then it becomes an important tool that it is a right for the citizen to demand this public good at his or her doorstep. Affordability is the key element. We have what is known as the Universal Service Obligation Fund, which is intended to take the telecom infrastructure right up to the village access point. The village public telephone becomes an important instrumentality in the Indian context and also more so in several developing countries' context. We would like to look at the provision of internet connection through this particular model. I'm digressing a bit to see how convergence uh, thoughts could be brought into the technological options to drive this whole concept of internet for all. Television as a medium is very popular among the masses. And television access is also uh, an important element. It is affordable in the current milieu because the costs have come down. It's an entertainment medium. Information, communication, and entertainment are getting converged. If the same cable operator were to provide the internet services through the cable network, I would think that envelops a lot. Technological solutions should be there to meet the society's demands. As a customer, I am only keen to obtain service at my doorstep. 
I would not be interested in knowing what are the technologies behind the provision of these services. I think policy makers, in experts, and other thinkers can converge on this particular provision to the last man standing. We always talk about last mile connectivity. Last man standing is an important thing, and I would like to look at the internet for all, exploring a rights-based approach as looking at the last man standing and seeing to it that the last man standing is not denied the right that he is entitled to. I would like to just dwell on these thoughts and leave it to the more eminent panelists with their wealth of experience to contribute to the body of knowledge and make this an interactive session with all of you interacting with us. Thank you. Mr. Ravi Shankar. Um, I would like to invite Mr. Abdul Wahid Khan from UNESCO. Well, thank you very much for that uh, surprise. I thought I was coming <coughs> after Radhika had spoken, but anyway, um, here I am. Um, let me remind you first of all uh, that um, the IGF is uh, the product of the World Summit on Information Society. It was created by WSIS, largely because uh, the WSIS could not come to a definite uh, conclusion on how internet ought to be governed. So the provision was made for further debates and discussions and dialogue. I would also like to remind you that um, the WSIS was uh, a long run. It was so many preparatory meetings, and, and it was also a, a slightly different approach to other summits. And we have all discussed and talked about the multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, UNESCO went to to this to the summit contributed to the preparatory processes based on uh, UNESCO's constitution asking this body to promote free flow of information and knowledge. Because uh, it is clear that the the advances in communication information technology, uh, more so in the last, say, 15, 20 years, really have allowed us to promote on a much larger scale, an unprecedented scale, the free flow of information and knowledge. But UNESCO's take within the World Summit on the Information Society was somewhat different. Uh, we constantly argued or made a case that the phenomena that the world was witnessing was not just information society, but knowledge societies. And we also tried to articulate that any vision of building knowledge societies, and I want to underscore the word societies in plural, must be based on, f number one, the foundation of such a vision has to be based on human needs and human rights. And one that would allow a, an inclusive knowledge societies and pluralistic knowledge societies. Because you cannot have one monolith knowledge society without taking into consideration the, uh, the diversity that we all know that exists in the world. So we advanced, we said, we argued that any vision of uh, building inclusive knowledge societies has to be based on four fundamental principles, apart from the, the, the basis that I mentioned already, human needs and human rights. One is universal access to information and knowledge. Second, freedom of expression as a fundamental human right. Third, respect for cultural and linguistic diversity. 
and four, quality education for all. Because if you really want to build an inclusive, uh, not a, but inclusive knowledge societies, you can't really have knowledge societies without providing quality education for all, without ensuring that there is a f freedom of expression as a, adopted as a fundamental human right, and without ensuring respect for cultural linguistic diversity and universal access, to which Mr. Ravi Shankar uh, devoted some time. When you look at these um, uh, four principles, after the um, second phase of the World Summit, when the question came up for the participation of various uh, partners or participants or actors in the deliberations of the internet governance, within the organization there was a, uh, a discussion whether or not the organization should participate in the internet governance discussions. An initial reaction within the organization was, but, but we have nothing to do with internet governance. What, what can UNESCO contribute or gain from being engaged in the discussions on internet governance? So our argument was that internet governance is emerging as a powerful tool for dissemination, for creation, for preservation, for sharing and utilization of information and knowledge. And if the organization is about promoting information and knowledge, how can we not be engaged in this process? Also, the, to ensure that the inter, any future governance of internet, in, internet has to be based on the principle of openness, because for ensuring universal access to information and knowledge without a governance structure that ensures openness cannot be achieved. Also, a part of that, of course, of openness was the whole principle of freedom of expression. We also argued that the, any future internet governance must be a multilingual internet to ensure that the governance considers seriously that it, if people have just access to technology without accessing information relevant to their needs in the language that they can understand, it will be largely meaningless for a, a large segment of the population. So those three major arguments then were accepted by the by the organization, and that's how UNESCO. When you look at, for example, UNESCO's take on this issue, that we have two other programs, Education for All, that I'm sure that most people are familiar with. Education for All within UNESCO is certainly based on uh, the human rights approach. It's a, it's a goal, even though the the organization's principal, principal priority is education for all. We know there are, there are still a large number of adults who are illiterate. There are a large number of children even today that do not go to school. But that does not mean that the organization's vision and mission is not, and goal is not to provide education for all. Then the, we also have information for all program similar to that of education for all. Information for all is based on the principle that I mentioned earlier, that information and knowledge is the most powerful tool for empowerment of people. And without ensuring how people receive information, certainly today it's not everyone has access to internet, but there are other means of providing information. However, internet is emerging as a very, very powerful tool, and therefore, any mission or goal 
to provide information for all cannot possibly be, the, 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 the human rights approach cannot be ignored. So these are the basic principles on which UNESCO has consistently uh, made its case that any governance structure that internet follows has to be, has to uh, have the, the freedom of expression at, at its heart, the openness at its heart, the respect for linguistic and cultural diversity, it's the f fundamental basis for it. And it, therefore, it continues to be engaged in any discussion on internet governance and argues that makes the case that it has to be based on human rights approach. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khan. I'm really happy you came second because after the overview that Mr. Ravi Shankar gave in the national context of, you know, building on a public facility or public utilities argument, this kind of an overview coming from a global engagement of UNESCO uh, was really appropriate. Um, also, um, this question of uh, if you look at empowerment of people, knowledge for people, you know, how does that translate into the question of the link with governance, which many times we're not able to make. I mean, why is an issue really connected to its governance? Is, is the jump, you know, is a conceptual jump that we need to understand. And uh, we hope that as the panelists continue to engage in this dialogue, that will be clear at the end of this session. So I invite. Uh, Brian Longway from the Kenya ICT Action Network. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming today. Um, my name is Brian Longway, and I'm chairman of the governing council of uh, the Kenya ICT Action Network, or Kiktanet for short. It's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, yesterday, in another session, I introduced myself as a bit of a schizophrenic policy advocate. Um, because uh, I simultaneously serve Kiktanet, which is largely civil society oriented, as well as lead um, the African Internet Service Providers Association, which is purely private sector oriented. Um, so sometimes I find myself arguing with myself. Um, nevertheless, um, I will be looking at this, the issue of Internet for All and exploring a rights-based approach um, more from an e-inclusion pers um, perspective and share some of the experiences and lessons that we've learned um, in Kenya and in Kiktanet um, in this same regard. Um, but first of all, what is e-inclusion? Um, I think Wikipedia has come to be known as a very good resource for getting definitions. And uh, what I've picked up says that you know, e-inclusion could be described as activities related to the achievement of an inclusive information society. Um, it covers mainly the development of appropriate policies, um, maintenance of a knowledge base, research and development, and best practices dissemination. E inclusion addresses participation issues for various disadvantaged groups as well, including those who might be disadvantaged due to education, due to gender, disabilities, ethnicity, or even those living in remote or rural areas. Um, Kiktanet uh, came about about three, four years ago, um, and can be described as a network of networks. Uh, it brings together both state and non-state actors, and uh, basically gets them involved in the process of decision making in key development sectors. Uh, it's a, essentially a loose network of networks. It acts more as, a, as an umbrella body that coordinates the actions um, of uh, the different stakeholder groups. Uh, there's a term, multi-stakeholder partnership, or MSP, which can be used to describe Kiktanet very appropriately. Um, Kiktanet has con consolidated uh, substantive stakeholder input into ICT policy dialogue within Kenya um, over the past several years. And besides performing advocacy activities, also acts as a, as a watchdog of sorts. Some of the achievements that Kiktanet has seen include um, issues such as vo voice over IP regulation. Kiktanet was able to consolidate input into the public consultations that were held by the regulator, and then subsequently engage in advocacy to speed up the adoption 
and introduction of the new regulations, which then led to a very coherent and a very well working um, voice of IP regime. Um, another important achievement that I can highlight uh, is the national ICT policy. Kenya has never had an ICT policy. Um, efforts over a 10 year period had resulted in three sets of drafts written by different government departments um, with little or no similarity or coherence between any of the drafts. So Kicktonet basically took this on board and facilitated the process in partnership with the government to engage all actors in a coordinated review and drafting of a single consolidated ICT policy draft and then followed that up with advocacy which led to the adoption by the Kenyan government of this uh, draft as the official national ICT policy in uh, the early part of 2006. Um, besides those, uh, those types of achievements, uh, Kicktonet has also been involved in a lot of the consultations and debate and discussions that surround the development of new laws, laws um, basically uh, to address issues within the ICT sector, ranging from the media bill, which touches on issues of censorship, uh, to the freedom of information bill, which touches on issues of privacy and uh, is seeking to replace the ancient, uh, something called the, the Secrets Act, which even prohibited at one point uh, government officials from using email. Um, and uh, a number of other bills, uh, including the ICT bill itself, the Electronic Transactions Bill. And what we do is we, we've been able to build up a sort of critical mass of resources. We have legal experts, we have communications experts, we have policy experts, strategy experts, who we are able to bring together and feed into these processes. Um, Kicktonet also conducts a number of different studies on key areas. One of the most recently concluded ones was a study on e-waste or electronic waste. Kenya, like many other development, developing countries, has been a victim of electronic dumping. Developed countries that have problems disposing of um, outdated or obsolete computer equipment sort of mask them as donations to developing countries and then send equipment which really can't work with modern software. And you know we end up having tons and tons and tons, thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of computers and monitors and stuff that can't really work, can't really be applied, and it's been given in the name of a donation. So we were able to conduct a study on this issue and um, are using that study to basically um, conduct a set of advocacy activities towards government that would help ensure that policies are introduced, introduced to control and manage um, e-waste and ensure that when a donation is being made, it is genuinely something that is going to be helpful to society. Um, finally, I'll close by just sharing the most recent uh, of our achievements, which was in the build-up towards this IGF. Kicktonet played a key role in coordinating the regional participation in this IGF by holding a series of national level IGFs in Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda, and then bringing the outputs from each of those national IGFs into a single regional IGF where we were able over a three day period to discuss our issues, highlight priorities, and come up with a single set of representations which has been brought by a team uh, to this IGF. And uh, I'll close there. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Maybe uh, during the discussion, it would be interesting really to also look at how Kicktonet and this entire process of the regional IGF really looked at right to the internet and um, you know whether you will have something to share about that as well. Um, I invite Michael Gerstein from the Global Telecenter Alliance and also from Community Informatics Research Network. This on. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Anita. Um, and uh, thank you uh, for the uh, earlier comments from the distinguished panel. Uh, I'd like to take, with your indulgence, I'd like to read uh, an excerpt from a, an article from this morning's Times of India as a prelude to my my remarks. Um, uh, 
I'll have to take my glasses off because I bro broke my reading glasses. So um, this this article is about a, um, uh, a number of fishermen and farmers in the coastal region who were uh, protesting. Uh, some actions by the government of India, and the over 100 of them had been vehemently opposing the creation of a coastal corridor in the state, um, and they were attempting to make their their feelings hurt, uh, uh, their representation to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Science and Technology, Environment and Forests, which was held a, held a meeting hearing in um, Hyderabad yesterday. Uh, after managing to finally enter the hotel premises, uh, the farmers were handed over copies of literature related to the coastal management zone. Unfortunately, it was in English, with which many of the farmers were not conversant. When this was pointed out to them, the committee members told the farmers that all details on the subject being, held, being heard had already been posted on their website. The farmers again protested that they were poor farmers without any knowledge of the internet or the English language. Uh, which goes very nicely and directly into the remarks I wanted to make today. Uh, my first discussions concerning the idea of a right to the internet was meant to be deliberately provocative. Uh, I have for most of my working life in this area been concerned with grassroots and specifically community use of information and communications technologies as a fundamental tool not simply for, the partic for participation but more actively as a base for achieving equality and communal empowerment in the information age. Uh, if Walmart can use ICTs and the internet to create the world's largest retail corporation with revenues far larger, larger than more than half of the countries of the world, then why can't communities equally use ICTs for local benefit and to in part equalize the, str the struggles over wealth and resources in which they, and particularly the most marginalized and impoverished, find themselves. I made this argument through my working life as a community informatics researcher and in the various policy practitioner and, and, uh, and other venues uh, where I've been active. I made these arguments based on principles of social and economic justice and equally based on simple assessment of the benefits and costs of maintaining people in poverty as opposed to providing them with the opportunities and instruments for personal and collective self-development. But it wasn't until, I rec wasn't until recently that I've thought of framing the issue in the context of individual and communal rights and related public responsibilities. And uh, I take uh, Ravi Shankar's comments, uh, very interesting comments in the way he's framed this discussion. I was first drawn to this position when a Canadian colleague pointed out to me the astonishing circumstance that applications for welfare payments in the province of British Columbia, where I live, were now only accessible in, the, in electronic form. That is, if one wanted to apply for welfare in British Columbia, one needed to gain access to the internet, maneuver one's way around within the internet sufficiently to find a specific public document, and then have access to and the means and knowledge for the use of some process to download and print the relevant document. Almost at the same time, the federal government of Canada was providing significant incentives towards having uh, income earners file their taxes online and strongly suggesting that within a relatively short period of time, this would be the only acceptable means for paying one's taxes in Canada. And recently I noticed in an electronic newspaper of some sort that parallel things were happening uh, in Sweden, um, and it publicly noted by the government of Sweden uh, uh, that uh, the internet access um, was, would necessarily have to be provided to uh, Swedish members of the public, since so much of the information which individuals might wish or need to access from government was now available only in an electronic and online form. These and other instances with which we are all familiar, and I, I see that similar instances here in India, uh, thus suggest to me that it is now possible to argue uh, that for members of the public in many countries of the world to effectively undertake and realize their rights and responsibilities as members of the uh, citizens, as members of the public, is necessary for them to at least have access to information and communications technologies and the internet. Moreover, if one looks more closely at the two examples that I pointed to from the Canadian context, the availability of simple access to ICTs in the internet is only the beginning of the requirement. 
In fact, in these instances, the requirement goes considerably beyond simple access, which is really what the, what's been discussed here in, in 